Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of Encrypted Connections. I feel like it's been quite a while since I've been in this uh, seat. Um, took a, about a week and a half off. Uh, just, uh, you know, like my, a lot of you guys knew, I was just getting burnt out. It happens. Uh, people kept telling me it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. <laughs> and uh, I kept saying, not to me. It's not. I'll be fine. And uh <laughs> It happened. I was tired and I just, I needed some time off. It feels like it's been forever. So I'm very, very excited to be here right now uh, and to see so many of you guys back in the chat. Um, you guys know I love you all. You're amazing. Um, but tonight, I'm excited, uh, as I always am, but I'm, I really am very, very excited about this, about our, our guest tonight. Um, it's somebody that I personally admire. Um, the whole group, uh, the Olympic Project, um, I think... It, you guys are doing incredible work, and um, one of the best parts about your team, at least from uh, where I sit, is that you're doing this wonderful stuff, you're getting these great results, and there's just no ego involved, uh, which seems to be uh, a very rare thing in this field, um, at least from what I've seen over the last <laughs> few months. But anyway, so... Everybody, please help me welcome our guest tonight, Shane Corson. How are you tonight, Shane? Kyle, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it, man. I'm very excited. Um, so it, since it's your first time on the show, um, I'm sure most people are familiar with you, but um, let's start right at the beginning. Let's get, you know, get the boring questions over with. Um, how did you get started? Like, w were you a kid who loved this topic or were you one of the people who had an, uh, an encounter that got you passionate about this? What was it? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, basically uh, I grew up in Scotland uh, and while I was in Scotland, uh, I was heavily involved and interested in paleontology. That was kind of my go-to, my love. And, uh, you know, my mom got me involved in cryptids in general, uh, Loch Ness Monster, Yeti, you know, Bondal Snowman, um, Sasquatch, Bigfoot. She started getting me books and, and I'd watch everything I could on the subject matter. And not like I said, I grew up loving dinosaurs and I used to write, you know, but way before the Internet, uh, you know, late 80s, early, early 90s, I'd write paleontologists in Glasgow in Scotland and uh, get their feedback. And they'd write me handwritten letters back. I still have them just talking about dinosaurs and, and where I could find fossils and whatnot. So that's kind of got me, you know, interested in finding things, looking for things. Uh, and then my mom, uh, she saw my interest in that and kind of got me hooked on, you know, uh, the cryptozoological kind of world. Uh, you know, she used to tell me that, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that's not been discovered by science. So that just kind of put, you know, you know, she put the bait out there and I took it hook, line and sinker. And uh, eventually, after uh, living in Scotland, uh, moved to the States, moved to uh, San Diego. And uh, that led me, you know, uh, kind of to where I'm at now, you know, and uh, moved over in 93. And uh, when I got to the States, I, I kept my passion up with paleontology and, and cryptids in general, but specifically Sasquatch, knowing that I'm in California and mm -hmm. just north of me. Is where the Patterson Gimlin film was filmed. And I thought, well, shoot, you know, eventually I'm going to get my own wheels. I'll be able to drive and sure as I'll get out. When I got my, uh, my first car and, and started traveling out by myself, I used to go up to Yosemite and the Sierras and San Bernardino and the desert areas and just drive and, and uh, look for evidence, try to have an experience, uh, talk to witnesses uh, in that short time, you know, from, 97 through 2006 when i was you know out and about camping and hiking and exploring i never really found anything of interest that i would say was sasquatch related i did talk to a lot of witnesses uh over the years and heard their stories and their encounters um ran into a lot of wildlife you know the usual bear and whatnot and got really comfortable being an outdoorsman uh, you know solo camping right, and camping with friends that would join me on some of these crazy excursions, but never really had anything happen. Um, it wasn't until I met my wife and moving up to Oregon is when I really uh, kind of, a lot of people hate this phrase, but put boots on the ground and got out there and started exploring parts of Oregon, the Tillamook area on the coast, mm. uh, Mount Hood area. 
Uh, and so um, that's kind of where, you know, I just kind of progressed in this direction to, to where I'm at now. There, there, uh, like for somebody like me, right? We were talking before. I live in Connecticut. There is not a whole lot of history here, as far as Sasquatch is, is concerned. Um, when people think of this area, they don't tend to think of it as being um, uh, very squatchy. I guess is the uh, pejorative term that people use. Um, although there are pockets. Uh, here where where they you know they they reside uh which i'm finding out um now but to live in a place like that to to come from scotland to california where you know like you said it's only a drive away to get to the spot where the most infamous piece of footage that we still have to this day um uh, of sasquatch was filmed uh and to be able to drive uh there it, it, it seems like just so exciting um, and even the, just the area there, right? The West Coast, uh, the, uh, the Pacific Northwest is the most historically, um, when people talk about Bigfoot, that's that's what most people think. They think the Pacific Northwest, right? Um, and there's so much mystery surrounding places like Mount Hood uh, and, and the Olympics. Um, you know, I, I just, it, it, there's a part of me that's very jealous, number one, uh, <laughs> that, that uh, you're out there. But what is that area like? I mean, I've seen pictures, but really in person, uh, what's it like? Is it like Jurassic Park? Because that's what it looks like. Yeah, I mean, up up in, uh, there's even parts in Northern California that are very Jurassic-like, the Klamath area. Uh, each on the West Coast here which is what I'm most familiar with. You know, I've done some stuff in Idaho and, and a few other states, uh, but I really like the West Coast. It has so, you know, like you said, the mystique, the mystery, but it has just the climate, I think, up here to support something like a Sasquatch. Not that there's not Sasquatch in other states. I fully believe there is, mm. um, but I won't speak to that. Uh, I'll speak to the West Coast here. It is primordial in a lot of aspects when it, when you look at, you know, Oregon and Washington just specifically, because I've lived a lengthy amount of time in Oregon and Washington now. Um, and we have such, uh, you know, uh, the amount of rainfall up here, uh, the amount of rivers and creeks and uh, lakes, mountains. I mean, mountains galore and timber. Mm -hmm. uh, you have just a plentiful amount of lushness up here that animals survive and thrive in. A lot of the areas that I traverse are very temperate. You know, our, our weather... In the Olympics, I'm not talking about some of the higher points where you get extreme snow and, and, and nasty, nasty weather. A lot of the areas we traverse, it's always wet, but it's temperate. You know, it, it stays within a certain temperature that something, you know, even a human could survive in for the most part. And so, and you just have a, a, an incredible amount of food sources, plant mm -hmm. life, animal life. You, you know, being on the coast, we have a lot of big salmon runs. We have uh, steelhead runs cutthroat different fish species we have clams uh, so i mean the amount of food up here for you know a human or an animal is plentiful uh, the amount of cover we have up here the amount of lushness um in a lot of territory up here that's never been traversed by foot never. you know that's n never you know uh it's uh you know i love going out to the woods not seeing trash you know i love going out not seeing yeah. human presence you know i was just out on a trip this past weekend with my, my buddy Derek and my buddy Miles, Derek Randall's of the Lint Project and a, a friend of ours, yeah. Miles. And uh, yeah, we got caught in a little bit of a snowstorm and, and it was kind of brutal actually. But, uh, you know, uh, it was just being out there and not seeing, going where, you know, looking in a new area we haven't been in before in a real deep drainage, a real deep ravine and seeing stuff that most people will never see or have yeah. never seen and not seeing any evidence of human humans being there or trash or um, just nature in, at its, it's at its finest. And uh, you know, Sasquatch aside, I mean, uh, I would be doing this regardless of Sasquatch. You know, I, I'm a hunter, uh, I'm a hiker, explorer, fisherman. And uh, that's what I'd be doing regardless of the Sasquatch phenomena. But it just, when you get in these areas and you see something, you know, a, a new waterfall you've never seen a new Creek you've never seen, uh, seeing fish swim in the water, seeing otters like we did this weekend, you know, river so cool. otters, and uh, you've seen evidence of bear and uh, deer and everything else. It's just, yeah, it's, it's something to behold. And 
and I'm very blessed that way. Yeah, it, it really is. It's so funny because we, I don't have any places that are that, um, you know, that are that remote here, but even just going to the state park here, uh, the, the biggest one in the state, which is the one that I, I go to regularly. Um, I was bummed out this weekend because there was a bunch of people. I was like, man, there's people here, <laughs> you know, right. because I'm so used to going out and there's really never, there's not a lot of people, especially this time of year because it's a little chilly and it's not, but um, I can't imagine what it's like out there. The word lush um, it, 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 from everything that I've seen, every picture that I've seen, it fits it perfectly what you're talking about out there. Um, and it, you know, the, the climate, um, it, you know, great apes live in rainforests. Um, so if, if these creatures, beings, whatever word you want to use are related to great apes, it only makes sense that they would thrive in this environment that it would probably be the best environment uh, for them to be in, in the United States of America. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, you know, the West coast in general, all the way up to British Columbia, uh, it is, it is lush. It is, uh, it, you know, it can be very temperate, but it has all the components for an animal like a Sasquatch. Uh, and once again, I, I said animal, I know a lot of people are like, Oh, it's people. It's this. I don't, I don't want to argue about what they are. I know these things are real. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they they easily can survive in these areas. Um, you know, let's just call them primate or anthropoid or something like that, whatever. But, uh, oh, no, it's got all the components. It really does. It's fascinating. You know, I had never been, you know, I'd lived in California for a lengthy period of time. When I came up to the Pacific Northwest, I was absolutely in heaven and floored. You know, growing up in Scotland, I grew up with rain, and, and it's very similar along that equator line. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. very similar weather. And I just fell right at home with, with the rain. And a lot of people don't like the rain. Uh, we were talking before the show how you like it. I love yeah, it. Yeah, I have no problems with rain. If I did, I wouldn't be camping out in it because it, it <laughs> rains all the time here. It just does. But, you know, um, you get used to it. And something like a Sasquatch or a bear or an elk or a mountain lion or whatever, they're used to it. And they survive and thrive uh, exponentially. And, and they're masters at it. And mm -hmm. it doesn't even bother them. So immersing yourself in in their areas uh, in their territory and accepting that and getting out there and exploring man it's it's uh, it's uh, like i said it's it's a true blessing to be out here and and uh, just exploring these areas um you know I, I live for it i'm out i'm out a couple times a week exploring and doing my thing yeah yeah i i agree it, when you when you get to be around places like that that are untouched by uh other humans and and they haven't been like you said there's not trash and we haven't ruined them you really start to get uh well if you don't i think you may have an issue but i would i would think most people when you see a place like that um you you the sense of gratitude for the fact that we all um, hit the Powerball by being born on a planet like this. I mean, I think it. A lot of times, it's easy for us to forget that the the fact that we were given something that that is so perfect and so beautiful at its best, right? I mean, yeah. it, 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 if you've ever traveled this country even just a little bit and seen things, you know, seen the green uh, the 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 mountains in New Hampshire or if you've seen the ocean in Florida or um, what, whatever it is, the natural beauty, the Grand Canyon. I mean, it's like, it, it's, it's so, it's so hard at that point to, to look around and see the other stuff and not get upset um, because we continue to do it. We continue to ruin things. We continue to t tear down forests and encroach on the land of the animals that were here before us. Uh, which kind of brings me to my next point. It, what happens if we continue to do this um, and, and these creatures? I, I'm not going to ask you what you believe, um, mm -hmm. but I'll tell you what I believe. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter because, uh, you know, we can agree to disagree and it's no big deal. But I believe that they are probably part ape of some sort. And uh, I guess according to the DNA studies that the mother was human. Um, the, so I, I, I believe that somewhere, somehow they're related to us. If we continue to encroach on the, the natural habitat of these, 
uh, creatures. If they have done what they've done to protect the the woodpecker, the owl, um, they're and and the proof comes out. I mean, you know, real proof positive that these things are real. Um, some of us know this already. Um, it's going to have to be some kind of humanitarian issue at that point, or it. I mean, the the they're going to have to do something really big to to salvage what's left uh, of their natural habitat. Uh, or do you think it's getting to the point now where it's going to be almost irreversible? I mean, we probably won't get to the point where we find the proof, but you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, we're doing more damage every day. Where are they going to go? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm an optimist when it comes to uh, your last point there about finding proof. I think, man, proofs around the corner. If, if that's what one, I seeking. hope so. I think if that's what's one seeking, yeah, I think uh, it's uh, I think it's inevitable um, that these things will be discovered and proven. And uh, the Olympic project isn't necessarily out to do that. Uh, a lot of people think we are. Most of us know these things exist. We're just out to document and and learn as much about them as we can. Um, so if in that day they are discovered, we can share our data. But um, yeah, I mean, listen, uh, there's a lot of timber companies up here taking timber down and all that. And I have no issue with that. They're, most of the timber companies up here are very respectful. Um, but still, as human population grows, we're encroaching more and more, not just on Sasquatch, but on all animals. Species. Everything. Yeah. Everything. You know, and you mentioned like the, the woodpecker and the owl, you know, there was big things up here years and years ago with uh, owls. Um, and they had to close down forests and, and do that sort of thing. Um, if Sasquatch has ever proven to exist, it's going to be a game changer on all fronts. Mm. Uh, because whether, you know, I, I'm not going to get in this argument that the government already knows about them. All, I don't know. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But if it's ever proven worldwide that Sasquatch exists, there'll be immediate repercussions from that. I mean, they're going to have to, cl they're going to claim whether they know it or not. They're going to say, well, we don't know what they eat. We don't know their you know where they go their travel routes how many are there are they endangered so they're going to shut down vast vast parts of you know uh of these national forests mm. mass parts of it so um then you go through the process of you know learning about them if one can uh, studying them and uh closing off huge areas so if they are ever proven to exist i think everything will be like dominoes it'll fall into effect where they have to close down huge areas um, of national forest and woodland DNR property, all that. So, um, but we are, I mean, slowly and yeah, everything, you know, I, it really annoys me that, you know, I mean, people leave trash out in the woods and, you know, animals are, uh, you know, I hate seeing trash out in the woods. I hate seeing trash on the side of the road. Um, and that affects all animals as well. Mm -hmm. You got wildfires, which are extraordinarily, they're getting worse. Mm -hmm. um, both man-made and natural wildfires that are taking out huge chunks. Look at the, the devastation in California. You know, I was, um, I was in down in California during the Cedar fire in 2003, which at that time was the worst fire in California. And my parents were about 10 miles away from where it started. They actually lost their house. And, uh, down there, it's, uh, not so much, uh, you got a lot of sagebrush. Um, and so, I mean, it wasn't like forest necessarily being burned though. There was, but it devastated the landscape. And mm -hmm. then you go to Northern California with some of the recent fires, how it's devastated, you know, Paradise Fire. You look at the fires that happened in Oregon and Washington, Idaho, Montana, British Columbia, uh, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona. I mean, that's a whole nother topic right there, just the fires. And so, I mean, not just for Sasquatch, for all animals, we got to do better, um, better at um looking at how we protect our forests and thin them out and, and, and all that stuff, because it, it, eventually it's, we're going to have nothing left. You know, it's just like our rainforests, uh, you know, in South America, you know, harvesting, we got to better manage this stuff mm -hmm. somehow, you know, we, it's a catch 22 because people need these, this material to build houses and, and all this, but we have to do a better job of managing it. Um, there's, and it's a fine line because people, you know, uh, you know, a lot of times we breed like rabbits. So we grow and grow and grow and traverse around. Um, but we can just manage what we have now, respect that, take care of it. I think um, Sasquatch will be okay and, and every other animal will be okay for the most part. We just have to including manage. Including us. Well, including us. I mean, yeah. I mean, eventually, who knows? 
Right. Yeah. There's a program going on um, in South America. It's not very big yet, but I was just reading about it the other day um, where there are um, uh, people getting paid or, uh, or um, they're doing their own like lumber cutting down there or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they're selling the, the lumber, the timber um, to, I guess, companies or whatever they're doing. Um, and so there was this program that was started where the, uh, the, this guy went to the federal government and got grants and money. And so basically now he's paying them to not cut these trees down um, so that they still have a way to make a living. So for every whatever, you know, however many trees they don't cut down, they would get the same amount of money. Now, I don't know, you know, how long that can last or whatever, right. but it, it's, it's an initiative and it's somebody trying, which, you know, I thought was really cool to see. Um, yeah. The other, the, the, I think that, um, I think we forget, uh, I think it's easy for, for all of us to forget because, you know, life is, um, you just think everything's going to continue forever, uh, you know, and, and, oh, don't worry, we'll be fine. Don't worry, we'll be fine. And that's not the case. I mean, this world has changed exponentially since I was a child. Um, the, the, the amount of not just wildfires, earthquakes, tornadoes, the storms are stronger. The weather patterns are weirder. Um, I'm not saying it's global warming, but all I'm saying is Mother Nature's not very happy um and uh you know some we, we got we just have to do better and this is i think one thing about this topic that doesn't get talked about a lot and i had a girl uh, a lady on not too long ago uh, on the last show um lauren and she she talks about how she gets her children involved in this and i think um one of the best things about doing that is it teaches them to to love and respect their environment if for no other reason than they have such a passion about learning about Sasquatch that they don't want to hurt the environment that the Sasquatch are in, and it teaches them to then respect the environment overall. Um, yeah. So I think. What's that? I say that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I think that's one of these things that when people start to get involved in this, this is a positive that that can come from because you uh, you know people who love this topic we love this topic i mean it's a passion like you said and um you don't want to do any harm you you want these uh creatures to thrive and so that we can learn more and finally figure out you know what's really going on um, yeah, i mean if, if you look at it too though i mean i want my so my daughter she's uh she's 11 years old mm -hmm. and she's into sasquatch but she's also an avid fisher woman a uh, little girl and and very passionate about the environment i want her to witness what I've, you know, mm. and experience what I've experienced over the years. And I want her children to do the same. Yeah. And so, you know, if we can install that, instill that in our children where they can instill it generational um, to, to respect the environment you're in, you know, leave it better than you found it. That's, that's something I live by. You know, if I see trash on the woods, a lot of times I pick it up. Most times I do, you know, and just to leave it better than you found it mm -hmm. because, you know, uh, you know, instead of being so obnoxious and just, you know, in, in the woods for yourself, look at the future generations uh, of just, you know, humankind, let alone the animals that are living there. Cause I want my daughter to be, be able to experience, you know, everything I've ever seen, go to a crystal clear Creek and fish, go, yeah. go see a bear in its natural environment, deer and elk and cougar and eagles flying around uh, to, to have that taken away would be horrible because nowadays everybody's you know when covid hit it really uh it <laughs> really had I, so much ran through my mind you know i was fortunate because i have areas you know they closed down a lot of the national forest and but i i can get out in the woods i know where to go and i i live in the woods so i mean i can get out there real quick i could take my daughter with me a lot of people couldn't now imagine we have no you know covid aside but they shut down the stuff because of uh wildfires or because of trash or human you know contaminant and all that wow what a horrible world we uh w would live in you know i mean yeah. uh, i i lived the camp i lived to hunt i lived to fish i lived to explore the woods and uh what a shame if others couldn't experience that if we ever get to that point that'd be horrible yeah agreed uh the other part to that covid thing is when everything shut down 
uh, one of the things that I noticed, and I'm sure a lot of other people noticed, is that the animals started coming out in droves because we weren't around. Right. We were inside. So that that you literally, they were showing the air was clearing up in certain parts of the world where normally it would be, you know, nasty, thick, you know, smoggy, and it was clearing up and um, deer walking down the road. And, you know, um, if that's not a, uh, a smack in the face, like to, to show you just what we're doing to this place, um, uh, we need, it just needs to stop. And, and that's why I said, I think this can be something if you got kids and uh, uh, who, you know, you can get them involved and not just this, any other animal, whatever, get them involved because it gives them a reason then to want to protect these things, uh, want to protect the planet that they live on. Um, it's easy to sit in front of your phone and forget about what's going on outside, uh, right outside your window. When I was a kid, we we fought to stay outside all day and all night. <laughs> it was like I literally would get up in the morning before the sun would come up and be like, Mom, can I get on my bike? Can I go outside? Can I go in the woods? And she's like, you know, it's still dark out. Like, chill out. <laughs> Wait an hour. And then, you know, and then they'd be calling you to come in for dinner and you just go like this. <laughs> right. <laughs> I didn't hear that. You know, until until she used your first, middle, and last name, then you knew it was time to go in. Yeah, trouble, <laughs> trouble. But you know, uh, the the point is, is that people, it, it we've they've gotten so far away from it because of technology that nature's become the last thing on a lot of these kids' minds. And um, if that doesn't change, then I don't think a whole lot's going to change. So um, I just think it's an important an important point to try to get them involved in something. For me, if if my mom said, "Hey, look it." uh there's there's these things are, are out there go out in the woods behind the house and go look for them i'd have been in those woods all day and night searching for sasquatch even though this the woods were you know 100 yards wide by <laughs> 50 feet wide but as a kid you don't care my nephew got a backyard and he swears to god that he's out there looking for him behind the trees and it's like yeah. dude go for it absolutely um but anyway i'm sorry i got kind of off topic there okay. um uh, so anyway, um, I'm going to jump right into this next topic because this is one of my favorites. Um, the nests, man, the nests, these things are incredible. Um, not only the nests, the placement of them, mm. it, that, that, because the nests are cool in, in and of itself, but where they were was so strategic um, on on that slope, uh, b hidden behind some brush, you know, near the top, so they could escape over the back if they need to, or go right down. Um, it, it gave them every opportunity to get away. Um, tell me a little bit about that. When you found them, what what I mean, I, I probably would have been jumping up and down screaming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, just just to be clear, so. The Alamut Project did not originally find these nests. They were found by a timber surveyor. Uh, so uh, where the nests are located, they're above a seasonal salmon creek. And so when a timber company goes out to log, they have to stay a certain amount of uh, yards. It's like 100 yards, I think. Maybe I think it's actually bumped, been bumped up to 125 or 150 yards. But anyways, the job of the timber surveyor is to go out there and you know flag trees and, and, and basically get a measurement from the creek to the top of where they're going to start timbering and this timber surveyor he's you know at that time he'd been uh, surveying for about 27 years solo you know so he goes out there in these remote areas um what a off, cool way job off. oh really cool job I mean, <laughs> whoo, yeah he's seen some stuff oh i'm but, sure you know being out there and that's his job he'd never seen anything like these nests that he came across being out there in this remote area he'd never seen anything like these he came across three or four at the time they were massive and he got a little spooked out and um, was doing his line and decided to get out of there and eventually got a, a hold of uh, his boss, the owner of the property. He got a hold of a couple of DNR guys, Department of Natural Resources, and he got a hold of Derek Randall's of the Olympic Project because Derek, by trade, day job is a landscaper and he had done some work for this particular surveyor 10 years prior. This guy, the surveyor, known that Derek... Um, is in the Sasquatch and Derek's also an avid outdoorsman, a guide and a hunter. Um, he invited Derek out said, Hey, have you ever seen like this? So this group of guys, DNR, the owner of the property, 
and Derek and Nate, they all go out there and they end up finding like five or six more nests total. I mean, a total of six, we eventually found seven uh, and none of them in all their years being out in the woods had ever come across anything like these ground nests. And they're, they're positioned two and a half miles behind a lock gate and way off trail um, below a ridge line on these fingers or plateaus that uh, dip down into a steep uh, ravine that goes to the San Baron Creek. They're, they were positioned, the original find was positioned like in a V formation with a large nest in the front that had two rocks right next to it. The only rocks above ground that looked like they had score marks, like something had been smacking them together. They were positioned by this point nest, as I call it. And they were kind of in a V formation. They were large, they were massive nests. I mean, anywhere from about three to four feet across and, and to eight and a half to nine feet uh, oval in shape, kind of like a bathtub, all made out of huckleberry, evergreen huckleberry, which we have in, especially up here, a lot of huckleberry, evergreen huckleberry. And to, to look at these things, the amount of work that took to make these nests uh, of different sizes at the same time, you know, these nests were all made at the same time. The huckleberry boughs, uh, anywhere from three feet off the ground to about nine feet off the ground, were snapped off the tips and that's what was used to formulate the nest. Um, just large, I mean, massive. The amount of time and work. Uh, I mean, I guess if you're an expert at making nests, it probably wouldn't be a big deal. Derek Randalls and I eventually, as an experiment, tried to make one between the two of us. It took us about 45 minutes. And after watching it dilapidate over a couple months, we realized that we had still not grabbed enough material to mimic one of these original ground nests. So... Um, it, it, to me, it's it's incredible. And to date, we found 24 total nests uh, because you have these, like I said, these plateaus that come off this ridge line. You'll have a plateau or a finger, and then 100 yards away through another ravine, here's another plateau with more nests, and 100 yards away or so, 70 yards away, another plateau with more nests. So they were spread out, all made about the about the same time, you know, roughly. Um, I we don't know if they were hopping from. You know, whatever made these, we're hopping from plateau to plateau over a couple of days, a week. Um, they were not made for a one night, uh, you know, like, like say a gorilla will make a ground nest one night and leave. These almost had to be made for a period of time, or at least to stay in more than a night, I would assume. Probably a couple of days to a week. Um, so they weren't just made for a one night spell. Strategically placed, like you said in the thickest brush and you could hear something coming down this ridge line easily a good distance away and you could escape really quick if you needed to so um yeah phenomenal phenomenal yeah it, it's really amazing stuff man um did i i may have somebody may have said just kind of said this in passing or um you could you could tell me were the smaller nests um, that you found, did it look like maybe a child had tried to mimic the bigger nests? So, so two of the nests we found in on two different uh, in the original nest there, as we call it, there is what uh, uh, we came across a bush nest. It was about a it was just like the ground nest, but this was built into one of the huckleberry uh, bushes, a couple feet off the ground, and it was a mimic, mimic almost exact replica of what was on the ground of huckleberry boughs that were, you know, kind of in this, uh, this one was a little more circular, but it was snapped off huckleberry boughs placed in this bush. It would not hold any weight. It looked like, uh, and Derek had done a lot of research on this when it comes to uh, uh, great apes, specifically gorilla. The, the gorillas will teach their young to build nests and they'll practice that. And it looked just like that. It looked like a practice nest of what was on the ground. It wouldn't hold any weight. The smaller nest in there, I mean, the smallest one in the original Arab 7 uh, was about maybe four feet across. So, uh, like I said, all these nests, most of, uh, three or four of them are about the same size, and some of the other ones were a little bit smaller, and there was one really large one. So, to me, it told me there was different individuals uh, of different sizes making these nests, or at least staying in them. I don't know, maybe one individual made the nest. I don't know. But the, the seeing that that uh, bush nest was phenomenal because we found another one uh, hundreds of yards away in another nest area that was exact replica of that one. So it looked like another practice nest. Oh, my God. That's amazing. 
Shane, I, um, this is so unprofessional of me, but I had this thing plugged in for three hours, and apparently I must have plugged it into the one outlet in this room that doesn't work, and it's about to die. I got to go run and grab the cord real quick. No problem. Hold on, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not a problem. I guess I could blab on here. I don't know who's in chat, <laughs> but uh, um, these ground nests, um, you know, 24 to date, Todd Hale and I of the Olympic project found a new one in 2020. So these were discovered, the original the nests were discovered in 2015, the end of 2015. And from 2015 through uh, the latter part, 2006, and we found 23 nests. And then eventually in 2020, after looking for new nests in different areas, we finally came across a brand new one in the making. So I, we'll probably touch upon that here shortly. But uh, uh, there was hair found in the nest that matched primate hair. Um, uh, foot impressions, hand impressions have been found in this area. So it's not just like ground nests are being found. These nests are phenomenal in a lot of ways because they point to something unknown uh, making these nests. Uh, we brought bear biologists out to this area, uh, wildlife biologists, anthropologists, you name it, and nobody knows what's doing this. Um, you know, at least no one's willing to admit what's doing this is what I should say. So, <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. Oh, there we go. Unbelievable. All right. Sorry about that. No sweat. I was just blabbering on here. Apparently my cord, um, I don't know, it's being tricky tonight because I just plugged it in and it didn't work again. And I had to wiggle and move, move it around. Hey, Kyle, don't, do not go back and listen to what I just said because I was bagging on you big time. <laughs> I was destroying. I was like, oh, this, oh, it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it, dude. I had it plugged in for literally three hours and I didn't even bother to check the battery because I was like, oh, this is probably fine, right? No, uh, stupid me. Should have checked it, but never had oh, that dude. problem before. Um, now I'm not comfortable. Now I've got the light behind me. <laughs> Gosh, unprofessional. This guy. Oh, who, man. Horrible. That's is, it. I'm out of here. Who is this dude? Oh, I'm losing my earbuds. Look at this. Kind of researcher. All right. Anyway. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. Unbelievable. So what did Shane say when I was gone, guys? They'll tell me when you're not here, you know. <laughs> no, I sent him, I, I sent him, I sent him a bunch of free swag if they don't. So I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I was just I, actually blabbering on about the nest some more. Oh, it's just the coolest thing, man. I can't like uh, when I watched um, when I saw it, it was on the trail. Uh, right. It was the trail to Bigfoot or um, yeah, on the trail, uh, on the trail, uh, small town monsters. Step three love. Yeah. Yeah. Small excuse me. Um, man, I couldn't believe it. Like I just that little kid in me just went, oh, my God, no way. Because you knew that you had. Like I, maybe you didn't. I I knew that there was something really special there. Um, that this was not just some, you know, um, this was not no raccoon. This wasn't any Fisher cat. This was something big, um, something with intelligence uh, to strategically place these things where they were. Um, to have the ability to have the high, high ground, also to escape down that slope if they needed yeah. to. Um, and then here, and I don't remember who I heard it from because you didn't. Did you speak about it in the in the movie about the nest, about the little nests? Um, I can't remember. So there's two versions. You had the like Amazon version that Seth did, and then there was a YouTube version uh, with um, Alex Petrikoff and Eli Watson that it was separate. It's uh, it's free on YouTube. I actually liked that one a lot because it goes more in depth, and it's free on YouTube about the nest. Um, so I like that version a lot. Because uh, it just goes more into depth. But I was going to mention that, uh, you know, speaking of what made these nests, you know, I've, you know, you release a little bit of stuff and people come out of the woodwork saying all sorts of stuff. Um, I moved to Washington state. I lived in Oregon at yeah. the time and I drove up and got to witness the nest. And I was so enamored with these nests. I moved up to Washington because yeah. I thought these are amazing. Um, they're unexplainable. 
um, I have to move closer. I have to move instead of being, you know, six, seven hours away. I want to be, you know, a couple hours away from getting up in this area. And so I moved up here because they were so phenomenal. Nobody could figure out what they were. And I wanted to study the snot out of them. I wanted to lear learn more about them. I wanted to find more. Um, and, but over the years, you know, um, bringing all these experts out to this area, like I mentioned uh, while you were, you know, uh, figuring your stuff out there, I mentioned that we brought in a lot of different academic individuals out there that are enamored uh, with the, with these nests that can't explain what they are or what made them. They don't match anything in North America. They don't match anything in the world. Closest yeah. thing they can come to is a, some sort of uh, primate, uh, like a, you know, a chimpanzee, orangutan, gorilla, that of that nature. Um, you know, I've had people come at me saying that they were woods rats nests, which I, that was the, that was the, that was the original one that came at me with. And I grew up, you know, I spent a lot of time in California, Oregon, Washington. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of wood rat nests, wood rat nests. They usually grab old material. They don't go nine feet up a tree, snap off a uh, huckleberry, green huckleberry and formulate the, a large nest. Um, they're usually mounds and they always have a, you know, ammonia, like pea smell to them. Mm -hmm. And they also have turds everywhere you know scat right none of that <laughs> none of um it. what else have been called uh bear beds bear that was one argument that i was like okay well that's a decent argument you could say they resemble some bear bed. these are nests not bear beds um i run into a lot of black bear and a lot of black bear beds up here black bear typically will scrape the bark off a tree and lay down in that sometimes they'll grab some conifer boughs and kind of build a little bed uh, but nothing, nothing remote, like remotely like these nests, nor do they build multiple nests in the same area, nor do they all, you know, you have five or six bears sleep together in the same area. doesn't happen. Mm -mm. Uh, so I thought that was silly. Plus there's no teeth marks or claw marks. These were snapped or peeled off, um, sometimes over an inch in diameter, which huckleberry can be very hard to snap off once it gets to a certain size and bears don't reach nine feet off the ground and snip a little tip off of one. Yeah, you know, huckleberry. Um, they've been called eagle nests. Uh, I when we went into this, we didn't go in. Oh, these are Sasquatch bed. No, these were just unexplained. And we did over two years of homework and bringing in smarter people than I, people with academic backgrounds that have seen nests and beds. No one can explain it. The hair that's been found in these nests is primate hair. It's that's not, what I was going to ask you. It does not match. It's not bear. It's not elk. It's not deer. It's not raccoon. It's you know and no eagle feathers have been found <laughs> but um which you would yeah, find a ton of a ton of, and you find um you'd find uh scat eagles yeah. poop all know? over the nest yeah and they don't build nests in the middle of you know th this canopy up top is so thick you can't fly in there with a drone we brought cliff barrickman out there years ago and he tried to fly this drone around it was impossible so you can't see from the top you can't see through this wall of huckleberry until you get into this area because once you're, it's, it's like looking at a house, you can see the house, they like can see the huckleberry wall. You can't, you don't know what's inside the house until you open the door and go in there. So once you walk into the nest area and you see the devastation of huckleberry breaks and leaves plucked off and in piles, huckleberry leaves in piles on the ground. Can you really fathom the, that something really special went on there? Mm -hmm. Um, and that, you know, that's something we look for a lot of times is huckleberry breaks. Now, a lot of animals will break huckleberry. I mean, uh, deer and elk, when they're moving through with their, their, uh, their antlers can break off huckleberry bears when they're eating, will break off huckleberry, um, natural tree fall will break off huckleberry. And so we do come across that sometimes. Oh, okay. Well, that's natural. That's natural. That's bear behavior. That's elk. But when you come into an area where the whole area is just completely broken off the tips and the leaves are plucked off. And you can just see that this took time and uh, intelligence and there's no claw marks. There's no teeth marks. This took something with a, a thumb with an opposable thumb to do. I mean, uh, it's uh, yeah, it speaks for itself. Yeah, it should. Anyway. I mean, if a little critical thinking goes a long way, um, yeah. you would think anyway. Um <laughs> Yeah, man. Uh, it's amazing. I, a matter of fact, I, the, I, I think I watched something um, pretty recently where a gentleman and it was on YouTube. So it wasn't and it wasn't anything that was like um, had been viewed a whole lot of times. I saved it to my stuff. I have to look it up. Um, 
but a gentleman had talked about how he had found a nest that sounded similar to what you guys were talking about, but this was in, oh gosh, um, this was in like North Carolina or something. Obviously, okay. the the materials were different, but the the nest from what this man described was basically the same. Uh, you know, it was large. It was um, kind of had a, a dip in it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the sides came up a little bit. Um, and um it was it was spongy i mean the way he described it was there was layers to this thing that uh -huh. if you laid on it uh it it provided cushion right um, that makes sense you know the nest another thing with the nest is that we brought uh, dr jeff meldrum out uh mm -hmm. originally back in 2016 to uh help take samples and look at these nests and when we you know i did learn more out of constructing a nest than i did deconstructing one but when we deconstructed one of these nests, Dr. Mildred had noticed that some of the huckleberry boughs had been pushed in around as almost like a frame. And and the the uh, boughs kind of formulated around that. So it, it took intelligence to build these nests is what I'm saying. Um, and so now I was blown away when we discovered that. I mean, to push huckleberry boughs in the ground to, to support Stay all alive. that brush. So we're yeah. talking... Uh, so much debris was brought in there, fresh debris, not dead stuff. This was all fresh, very spongy, very mattress-like. Yeah. Um, these nests are found, they have been found throughout history. They're they're rare. Usually it's almost always found, almost always found by somber in someone in the timber company. Um, and that blew my mind because I did a lot of years and years of research on this. I'm like, well, these can't be the only nests ever found. And lo and behold, they are not. Uh, Robert Alley has a book called The Raincoat Sasquatch. He has a great picture of a nest found in, in um, Alaska, I believe, uh, that it's a mimic. It's, it looks just like the nest we came across, yet it's made out of different material. It's massive. Um, a lot of people don't know this. 1967, what happened? October 20th, Roger, and Patter, Patter, Ro Roger Patterson and Bob Ginlan came across Patty. They filmed her. Well, uh, that same year, Lyle, Lyle Laberty was a timber cruiser, timber surveyor, uh, who was interviewed by Daniel Perez uh, a couple years back. And he came across that same year a nest above Scorpion Creek. Well, Scorpion Creek feeds into Bluff Creek. So Bluff Creek is where Patty was filmed. There was a nest found there, and stone, uh, Scorpion Creek is a stone's throw away from Bluff Creek. There was a nest found there. Um, and there's been lots of nests found throughout history. I shouldn't say a lot. There have been nests found throughout history, but they are rare. I don't think, and this is my personal conjecture, my personal opinion, I don't think Sasquatch needs to make nests all the time, and I don't think they do. Uh, we as the Lint Project members have kind of collectively thought about this at length, and the thing we can come up with is there's a couple things we know. These nests are being made at the end of February to March, that kind of that kind of time frame, roughly, you know, within a month. Um, they're found in remote areas. They're predominantly up here, at least, made out of huckleberry. Every huckleberry um, actually has medicinal purposes. Uh, Squatcher Metrics, if you guys are not familiar with Squatcher Metrics, he's on YouTube and, or excuse me, on Facebook and on Instagram. He's mm -hmm. a data analysis sort of guy. Yeah, he approached me one day about uh, the benefits of huckleberry, spe specifically evergreen huckleberry, and I, the medicinal purposes. And I said, "Well, I haven't really thought about that." Well, lo and behold, uh, they do have a medicinal purpose. Uh, doctors used to give women, human women, a concoction of huckleberry leaves and sugar for um, you know um, after childbirth to regain their strength, and so. When I started looking back at the huckleberry leaves that have been plucked and piled up in areas and why and that the nests were made out of strictly nothing but huckleberry, it kind of blew my mind. I really started thinking about maybe these nests are made for a period of time for birthing purposes, you know, for, for a nursery sort of setup. Because you have the salmon bearing creek at that time of year, the salmon sometimes pile up. You could walk across them. You have the huckleberry itself. You have the huckleberry leaves. You have ungulates in this area, all sorts of deer. You have uh, all sorts of mushrooms and other berries, salmon berry, Oregon grape, salal berry. 
So you have this perfect storm in a perfect area to give birth if that was a purpose. Um, and when I look at, uh, I brought up Patty, for example. Well, some people don't believe Patty was a real Sasquatch. It was hoax. I, I fully believe. I know Bob Gillen personally. Uh, I've, I've gone through that story. I've watched Bill Munn's work on it. Um, Dr. Jeff Meldrum's work on it. And you name it. That to me is a real Sasquatch. Yeah. And, and if you do believe that's a real Sasquatch, well, it's a female Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. You know, she had large breasts, um, you know, you know, all that stuff. Well, there was a nest found in that area at that time. And a lot of people argue that maybe, you know, she was walking away kind of nonchalantly, kind of briskly, but maybe she had little ones in the area. I mean, this is all hypothesis conjecture, but I was fascinated that there was a nest in that area. So maybe these are birthing scenarios we're looking at. Possibly. I don't know. But that's kind of our the direction I'm going with right now. Because we, we spent years and years after 2015 looking for new nests. It wasn't until 2020 that Todd Hill of the Olympic Project and myself were out in the area and found a brand new nest in the making. We heard the thing walking in this area. We never got eyes on it, but it circled up behind us. And when we eventually went down to where we'd heard this thing, we finally found a new nest in the making, but it was fresh. And there was huckleberry boughs broken. Um... It was phenomenal. And we found eventually found hand impressions, 14 inch tracks. By the way, Patty was about 14 inches. Uh, we found uh, all this huckleberry breaks and a huge pile of huckleberry that was being formulated into a nest. And that took us, uh, you know, four or five years, five years. So we think, uh, you know, hypothesis, we've got to test everything. Sure. We think that maybe, you know, they, they pass through this area and they're in this area quite frequently, we think, but they only make nests. For specific purposes if you look at orangutans for example they give birth every six to eight years maybe sasquatch is something similar to that completely different obviously but maybe it doesn't give maybe sasquatch are not like humans where we give birth every year maybe they give birth every four or five years every six years who knows but it's it's fun to think about right absolutely uh and what and i mean there's not anything else out there that says to the contrary. So um, I think it's a great path to, to look down and, and you guys are obviously putting, you know, um, a lot of data behind this. Um, the, 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 first of all, the, the, I have to say this because I think it's the most ridiculous thing that people still think that Patty was not real. Um, just the boobs alone. I mean, let's be real here. It was 1967. Did it, no one even noticed them until someone was like, hey, wait a minute, she's got breasts. And right. then nobody ever in a, it would ever think to put breasts on a fake costume. Uh, nevertheless, back in 1967, when they didn't even, there's no way, just uh, there's no way. I can't get started on that argument because I'll stay <laughs> on it for an hour. Just, it gets me so upset, man. I can't, like, it's just nuts. But I think what you're, what you're talking about um, for me, I'm right there with you. Uh, I think that they do things purposely. I think that there's probably a lot to be said for why something that loves to remain so hidden uh, is so reclusive. She just walked out in front of these guys, made, sta looked at them, made eye contact like, yep, I'm here. Um, this is not a behavior that is normal for these creatures or these beings. Um, so to think that maybe she was a distraction, right? The baby could have been over there. And wasn't there other foot uh, tracks found in the area too? Smaller ones or something? Um, or there was three uh, sets of tracks or something? Yeah, there was three sets of tracks. Uh, I, I can't remember off the top of my head if there were different size. They did. I believe there was a smaller set. Um, but, but real quick, to get back to you something, because you just, I love when you, when people trigger stuff in my head, you know, I could think about and explain. Yeah. So, I think originally when they came across the creek, she was kneeling down in the creek or by the creek and it stood up or Patty did a lot of, uh, this gets back to why trail camera use, for example, uh, if you look at a, a whole bunch of reports across the board where, um, it, either the Sasquatch is surprised, like what happened with, uh, Bob and, and, uh, Roger or the human is surprised. Like, you know, it happens a lot of times around creek beds and rivers because there's noise and there's smells. Can't hear you. You can't hear. So if you look at a lot of, I mean, I've taken in so many reports and read so many reports over the years where someone's fishing 
and there's a Sasquatch or, or the Sasquatch is in the water and there's a human and they're both equally surprised or one surprises the other. If you're placing tail cameras, place them around riverbeds or creeks, cover up the cell, the smell and the sound. Maybe a little seem, maybe they won't, but there's something to placing trail cameras in those areas. If you look at the vast amount of sightings, in my opinion, I know it's kind of off subject, but no, people no. go, Oh, trail cameras don't work. I don't think they really do, but you know, I won't give up on them. I don't think enough people uh, place them in areas like that because the vast majority across the United States and British Columbia, when someone's setting a trail camera, yes, there's thousands of them out there, but they put them on game trails. They put yeah. them where they're going to, you know, I'm a hunter. I know where to put one to capture bear, deer, elk. You name the time of year, I'll get it. Oh, no, I, I can get cougar. I get uh, bobcat. Um, but I don't know where to put them to get a Sasquatch. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's very arrogant of us to say, oh, well, we should have them on trail camera. Well, I think they have been on a few trail cameras. Yeah. I have I think I've captured one on there possibly. I've seen other trail camera photos out there that are mind-blowing. I wish they would go public, but probably never will. Um Oh, but what? We're, Are you going to tell me about these? Uh, you know, <laughs> well, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I see a lot of these things at symposiums. Uh, you know, I'm speaking at Squatch Fest at the end of the week here, and I've been at some of these conferences and seen some amazing photos by people that don't want them to go public. They don't want fame. They don't want them shared. They just wanted to share them with somebody to get their opinion. And I'm like, well, that's better than Patty, in my opinion. But uh, yeah, right. I've seen some. Um, so, yeah, I mean, trail cameras can be of use, I think. Uh, like I said, I kind of derailed there the conversation. No, but I just you're talking about creeks and Patty. Uh, you know, maybe there was a little one there, maybe she just got totally caught off guard. Which, you know, horses, and you're talking about quadrupeds rather than foot. You know, maybe thought it was an elk walking up or a deer. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's a great point. Um, and you're right. I mean, the those areas, but for they just kind of overwhelm the senses, don't they? Um, you said they have the noise, they have the smells. Um, I remember the video. Um, um, oh gosh, fresh! You're gonna kill me. He's in the comments right now. He's a buddy of mine. This is like his favorite video. Um, I forget the guy's name, but it was the video where the gentleman was filming one, supposedly in the swamp down oh, south, down in Florida, and it was breaking the tree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those swamps stink to high heaven, man. They don't smell good. Well, I call um, it skunk ape, right? Right, exactly. Um, and that guy walked right up behind that thing. And, um, you know, so, I mean, it makes sense. It makes a whole, it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, me, I'm going to get a couple questions here from these guys because people have been asking questions and I, um, I missed so many of them. Um, let's see. Do, oh, Janelle wants to know, do, do you know if they abandon the nests after you mess with them? Yeah, that's a great question. So, they were found in the month of May. So they, by this timber surveyor. So I think they were long abandoned. Now the evergreen huckleberry will stay green for months. Mm. So when they were found, they were still green, but they were abandoned. Uh, the timber surveyor didn't, I uh, didn't, didn't scare anything off. We didn't. I think they were used for a period of time and then vacated because uh, if, if anything, I don't care if it's a Sasquatch, a person, a bear, if you stay in one area too long and you eat up all those resources, you're going to be noticed at some point because you have to sure. keep eating and tearing stuff down. And so you have to be kind of semi-nomadic. You have to move around. So I don't think those Sasquatch, I think after maybe March or April, they were long gone or at least out of that little area. Cause this is a vast area. You could, they can move a thousand feet and be in a whole nother ravine doing their own thing. We never see them or hear them. Right. Um, um, so yeah, I don't think we disturbed anything. I don't think they were going to come back there, uh, because the, they'd already tore up the area, that area, they, they have to move on to sustain themselves. So, yeah. Right. Um, it's kind of the nature of the beast, right? Is that, that, um, staying in one spot too long and you're risking being seen no matter what's going on. Um, but I, I, now this triggered what you were talking about before with me, when I mean, you were talking about where they had these nests and how there was such a, a, a wall of brush um that was protecting them it was like you know walking through the front door of a house mm. um it, it, it people aren't going to go in those areas you're not if if you're out hiking you're not going to yeah. walk into the thickest brush there is because why would you why would you do that right you, number one you don't know what's behind it right could it could be anything laying in that brush um and my stupid battery is saying it's dying again. What in Sam hell is going on here? Um, 
so you know who who knows what's back there um but it, it, it like i'm i'm out in the woods the other day and i see the thickest green uh, uh small pine trees right and i'm like well, if they're going to be anywhere they'd probably be in there mm -hmm. but I, i'm i'm still not going to walk straight into it because number one it's going to be a pain he has to do it and number two what if I do walk in there and something's right there and I step on one of these things hand or something? <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be that guy. I mean, I, you know, I'd love yeah. to give, love to give one a cuddle, but I don't want to be the guy well, gets it's, it's a great point because like I, I kind of said before, um, this was found by a timber surveyor and he had a job to do. So he had to go out there. These yeah. aren't areas people go hiking, fishing, exploring, uh, or hunting. It's too thick. Some of this huckleberry is nine feet tall. You can't see, but a few feet in front of you. It is a wall of huckleberry, and that goes to speak to the intelligence of where they built these nests because – or whatever built these nests. I'm pretty sure I know what did, but the wall of huckleberry, they didn't touch the outside of this wall. It was just everything inside there, everything inside this wall of huckleberry because if had they, you would be able to see down in there. Mm. No, no. They made their they made their house, their casa, and they survived in that little area for a period of time, and uh, it was – unnoticeable and the, nobody's going into these areas now derek randall's myself and quite a few others on the project we love off-trail hiking it's like our we just yeah. get off we love it so do it i is, i hate being on game trails i hate being on man-made trails we like to hit the bush the nastiest stuff and go through there um because you get to see things that people don't get to see you get to see wildlife the stuff there yeah nests <laughs> you know and that's where these nests are being found remote hard to get to areas um, you know, like I said, I, when I get sent nest photos or supposed to nest, most of the time they're structures. This is not a, a structure. There's no, the canopy, the tree canopy, the Douglas spur, you know, 90 plus feet off the ground and more. That's the canopy, which is natural. These yeah. are ground nests. They're not a structure and they're not found near any man-made trail whatsoever. So I'm not saying Sasquatch doesn't build nests near man-made trails, but I think it's very unlikely. That's just my, I get sent photos periodically and I go, well, you know, how far do you have to go? And this and that. And they're, oh, man, it's right here. And I said, well, it, well, one, it doesn't look similar to, it could be man-made. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I, I try not to argue too much with people because I don't know everything. I'm not an expert on nests. I'm not an expert on much, but these nests that are being found both now and historically are found in very remote and rugged areas. And so, um, I don't encourage people to get off trail and do that stuff by yourself. Do it with groups of people if you're going to, you know, um, don't dangerous. go missing 411 on me, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the thing. You just don't know. That's the yeah. problem, right? Um, and it's not, none of it's worth your life. I, I had this conversation not too long ago with somebody who I was um, who was on here saying they were going to go do something I thought was really dangerous. And I just kept saying, you know, it's not worth your life. It's just none of it is. As much as we want to know, like, you know, don't don't be stupid. Let's play this game smart. Um, all right. Well, so we've talked about the nests. Um, and it's already been an hour. Good Lord. Uh, I feel like it's been 15 minutes. <laughs> um, so, okay. So I ask everybody this, and I need to ask you this because it's one of my favorite things to listen to, and I'm sure it's everybody else's, at least on their list. Um, tell me the coolest thing that you've seen out in the in the bush Um since you since you've been out there the coolest thing you've seen heard if you had a close encounter where you got to peek at one of these things or yeah i'll, I'll keep this kind of brief but uh so but really you know i've been at this since about 97 and um 2011 when i was down in oregon living down in oregon uh, a couple of friends of mine co-workers we decided to uh one of my passions like i said before is fishing i love fishing but i love high alpine lake fishing and stuff like i like remote i like to get away from people i like yeah. to fish for trout um and i like new scenery so we planned a trip out to this area in uh, mount hood and uh it was august 2011 and we had a two-night experience where um you know the first day we kind of got lost we eventually made it back to our camp and that night we had uh, something moving around or you know we had three separate tents to my buddies and I, and uh, around this lake, beautiful lake, we had something walking back and forth. I heard what sounded like uh, rocks being clanked together as it got closer and closer. And um, 
uh, eventually, you know, just one of my buddies was awake at the time and he, uh, he heard it too. And we were kind of going, what the heck is that? Could it be elk, you know, antlers, uh, you know, I mean, it's August, I don't know. Uh, and that clanking sound, uh, started again and it dissipated as it got further away. And that was our night experience, the one night experience. I mean, there's a lot to it, but, um, the, the following day we go back out and we go fishing all these different lakes, you know, a mile away, a mile here. Uh, we, we were there to fish. And so we come back and yes, I was involved in Sasquatch. Um, I won't lie in the back of my head. I was like, well, I don't know. I don't, I've never experienced anything like that. I've been camping all around Yosemite, the Sierra San Bernardinos, the deserts all over Oregon. I had never experienced anything like that. So yeah. I, I didn't know what to make of it. It was a little freaky. It was about one thirty or, you know, two ish in the morning, uh, crystal clear night. And it was just something walking around, um, you know, maybe a, a knock. Uh, I won't swear to that that night. I believe I heard a knock, but it's one of those things. I try to keep it real. Um, the next night was a whole different scenario. You know, same thing. We went fishing that day, came back, made a fire, cooked, talked about our plans for the following day. Because we're going to be out there for three or four days and we're on a second day. So we're discussing which lake we're going to hit next. Well, we all go to bed and that night, uh, same thing. We heard this like knocking noise getting closer and closer and closer from a distance closer and closer and i say we which is my buddy mitch and i that were awake at that time hearing it and talking like whispering it's back it's like time in the morning again too where it was like 1 32 in the morning um and it got closer and closer and then it stopped and you just hear it marching around stomping around we were down by this lake and we had a little bit of a, a hill next to us and this thing was going up the hill and down the hill my buddy Mitch was awake and he heard something to his left. Well, I'm hearing something to my right. Something, well, could there be two of whatever the heck this is? No idea. My buddy Ian, the third party, um, he's a heavy sleeper. He slept through it the first night. Well, he slept through this portion the second night. And as this thing's marching around, it stops. And then I hear five of the most powerful, you know, you call them uh, power knocks, whatever. Knocks. And it echoed in this valley. Just bam, bam, bam. And you could feel them in your tent. You could feel the reverberation from it hitting the tree. Now, Mount Hood, a lot of the ground has got a lot of roots and stuff. So it's kind of fibrous and kind of hollow. Well, when it was hitting the tree, it was so loud. It would echo off the side of the canyon wall, the lake wall. And we're all awake now. My buddy Ian's now awake. And he's like, what is going on? He's you know cussing. He's freaking out. And I just kept telling him, shut up, shut up, shut up. And as we're laying there in silence, after that transpired, up through the trees, I hear something coming through the trees up high, hitting branches, and then thud next to my buddy Mitch's tent. He's right next to the lake. And there's a little bit of um, skunk cabbage there and uh, mud. And I could tell something had thrown a rock because you could hear the thud. We both whispered to each other, you know what that was? It was a rock. So now I'm freaking out. I'm like, Whew. And my buddy Ian, who is from Boston, a transplant to Oregon, he was an outdoorsman. He didn't like bears. Uh, he really only wanted to go because we were going. And my buddy Mitch and I were pretty good outdoorsmen. And uh, he's freaking out. And as I tell people in you know retrospect, as a mistake on my end, previously that day while we were lost, um, the, the day prior, excuse me, while we were lost, I'd given him a, a pistol. Uh, he had no business having one, <laughs> but I just wanted him. I wanted him we were up there on the mountain lost. The first day we were there, we were seeing bear sign and he's scared of bears. He was banging pots. And I said, knock that off. We're all armed. Bears hate people. We're not going to get bugged. So I ended up giving him a pistol. Well, that second night we're there when we're hearing all this stuff going on. Um, I thought he was going to shoot somebody. So I decided to get out of my tent, which I really didn't want to and get that, calm him down, get the pistol away from him. Uh, like I said, idiotic move on my, I know I've already kicked myself enough times over it. Uh, but I decided to get that weapon from him because I didn't want one of us getting, you know, um, uh, hurt. Um, so as I unzip my tent and we we were kind of in a triangle of formation ourselves. Uh, my buddy Mitch is over here. I'm kind of at the point, the, uh, top of the triangle and my buddy Ian's closer to the hill where the stuff was really going on. As I unzip my tent, I'm looking around. And hoping I don't see anything and sure as I'll get out uh, 40, 30, 40 yards away behind this big Douglas fir, I see something swaying. And what I see is I see a hand on the front of this tree. 
large black hand, arm, and I just see something doing this. So it's going from behind. The arm's just kind of moving a little bit in the shoulder, but it's popping from behind the tree, back behind the tree, out from the tree, back behind the tree. And it does that a few times, and I'm looking at it. I don't know if it's directly looking at me. I think it is, and I'm not moving. I don't want to move. And it takes its arm down, swings around its side, and it walks up this little game trail and leaves. And that was it. And I didn't get out of my tent. I just sat there. My buddy Ian's quiet. My buddy Mitch is quiet. I just sat there and sat there and sat there. I zip my tent back up, and I just sit there. I'm hoping this thing doesn't come back. Because uh, now I'm thinking in my head, well, it came back a second night. And now I know what I saw. And I'm like, what's its intention? Uh, you know, it's it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Daylight's not for another two hours. Uh, so I thought about getting, getting out and building a fire. All these things were run through my head. But nobody was moving. Everybody was quiet. So we just sat there. I think all of us just sat there for a couple hours till daylight. We collectively got out of our tents as soon as daylight hit, packed up our stuff, and hiked out. And uh, didn't talk about it uh, pretty much the whole way home. It wasn't like till maybe a week later uh, I talked about it with them. And um, my buddy Ian, I don't think he's ever stepped foot in the woods again. My buddy Mitch and I have been back out there since. And uh, it wasn't until months later we had some other stuff happen. Uh, but for, for a long period of time, we didn't see nothing or hear nothing. So anyways... Um, there's a lot more to that story, but the thing what I learned was that, um, well, first of all, it solidified the existence of Sasquatch for me. Mm-hmm. And that's what eventually got me tied in with the Olympic project because all the research I've been doing in, or supposed research I've been doing in California and Oregon up until 2011, I thought was good. No, it was junk. I was really, I'm a good outdoorsman, all that, but I was really not documenting anything. And when I got involved with the Olympic project, I learned to document everything and uh, you know and do a lot more than i had ever done before yeah um but that encounter solidified sasquatch for me i knew without a doubt that they were real there was no mistaking what i saw what we experienced and um the reason i uh kind of backtrack a little bit the reason i think we had that two night experience is because we had gotten lost up on this ridge line and we were way off trail going through you know god's country and uh, where nobody goes, that we were off trail, we missed, we totally got lost. We hiked 17 miles that first day, lost, Jeez. and uh, ran out of water. And that's like I said, it's a long story. Saw a bear sign, maybe not bear sign. Um, and I think we disturbed something up on that ridge line, and it decided to come down, way down to where we were camping. And hey, <laughs> out, get out of here. Uh, you know, so that's my. I thought of, uh, at length about this. You know, was it because we were close to the water source? Uh, was why did this thing come back two nights in a row or things? Cause there could have been two. Um, I only saw the one. Why, 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 why? And the only thing I think of is that we got up on a ridge line and years later, I kind of coined the phrase ridge ape. Um, mm-hmm. Only because I think these things love ridges. They love the high ground. As you spoke about early Kyle earlier, the high ground, I think means everything to them because they can scale things way quicker than we can uh, ridiculously quick. And they can oh, stay, yeah the viewpoint. And so that's just the things that was running through my head and still runs through my head. Um, and so uh, when I look at the nests, they're just below a ridge line, uh, and they can scale down or they can go right back up and in any direction. So a lot of the stuff, eventually uh, you've been at it for years and you've experienced stuff kind of starts paying a picture. And so, um, yeah, man, that that's the, the small and just of my only sighting uh, visual sighting. I, 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 seen some stuff through therm uh before um years later um that was pretty dang compelling mm. but that was my only visual and it, yes it was at night but when i went back and measured where this thing because there was a branch above this thing's head and it was kind of when it was swaying back and forth side to side it was kind of brushing up against it it was no shorter than seven seven and a half feet tall and just massive um no i didn't see uh any impressions there were some flattened areas down there uh I didn't go back and look at this the next day. This was later on. I went back and there was some flattened area there, but these things are real and and that solidified it for me. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, they are real. Um, The, I, I, sometimes I wonder if it's less about getting you out of there, like in that situation, because if it really wanted to get you out of there, it could have done something much more aggressive. 
Right. Um, you know, when you talk about a, a, a creature that's seven to 10 feet tall, sometimes taller, depending on who you talk to, um, you know, a thousand pounds, maybe, uh, you know, conservatively. So I've, uh, when I've heard people talk about the size of these things and, and, um, you know, I would imagine that some of them probably push 1500 pounds, 2000 pounds if they're, you know, 10 feet tall or 12 feet tall. Um, and as, and as heavily muscled as people talk about, um, it, when you have something like that, if it, all it's, all it's got to do is just put on a display and most people are gone. You're, mm -hmm. we're, you're out of there, man. No one's hanging around for that. Um, I think sometimes for me, I wonder if it's, it's more curiosity than anything. Like maybe they saw you up there. And again, this is all just theory, right? Because mm -hmm. who am I? What do I know? But maybe they saw you up there. Maybe you did, you know, kind of traipse through their area a little bit. And they were like, um, you know, let's go down and see what these hairless monkeys are doing. Um, let's see if they're doing their stupid thing down there. With, whoop, my mic went off. Let's see if they're doing their typical stupid stuff down there where they're building that, you know, hot glowy thing and, uh, um, you know, casting those rods in the water. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with you. To an extent. So when we're up on that hill, I mean, you got to think about a couple of guys up there. We're being loud, obnoxious. We're urinating. We're leaving our scent. Uh -oh. We're traversing where people just don't go. To come back for two nights in a row, you're talking about something that's trying to stay elusive. I do think they're curious. I definitely think they're curious. And I think they, you know, um, but with Sasquatch, it's not a cat. Curiosity kills a cat. Curiosity, they know just far enough how to stay back without being seen or discovered for the most part, I believe. I think that experience for me with the rock throwing, and it was a good, you know, a little bit smaller than a softball with the tree banging, uh, the stomping around two nights in a row. It was it was a show of display that and, and like I said, I could be wrong. Absolutely. Uh, I just it was just one of those things where it was, you know, it wasn't aggressive. Everybody goes, oh, I had an aggressive counter. Well, your aggressive may not be someone else's aggressive. Yeah, sure. These things are showing a display of power in, you know, curiosity. Well, you know, I've had quite a few experiences, I believe where I think they were curious, just coming in silent, quiet, and just viewing us from a distance, N not knocking on trees or yelling or throwing rocks or anything like that. And I never heard one vocal the whole time we were there. I never smelt anything during this encounter. I never heard a vocal. Uh, maybe I didn't hear anything because my heart was in my head pounding. You know, <laughs> uh, I was extremely scared at the time. I don't mind saying that. Um, yeah. But this was just like, and we're in an area where, where our camp was. There is a trail where people will hike this trail. So people do come through there. Where we went is where people don't go. Um, and there have been other encounters in this area. Uh, his, you know, I went back and most of the encounters I found were not on any Bigfoot forum. They were all on AR forums, uh, hammock forums, hiking forums, N not places people would look for a Bigfoot encounter. You know, we mm -hmm. always go to, you know, the usual BFRO or you name it, uh, Bigfoot encounters and all this stuff. These were these encounters were found on forums that it took me two years to find because I had to look and put in the name of the lake and the area and people like, I had this happen and I was blown away and most of them were curious kind of thing you know like more curious uh, though some did report having rocks thrown at them um, so I mean who knows I it always it's one of those questions I don't know if I will get the answer to but I just to have a two night experience for a lot of people that's I mean for me I don't know of many reports where people have a two night experience, unless they're like their homestead around a cabin and they have something regular activity yeah, or something. Yeah. 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 Regular activity. This was a uh, really interesting. And um, the way it was swaying behind a tree was kind of almost, I assume like almost like a nervous behavior. You know, if you look at primates in general, they'll do that. They'll sway back and forth. That's a nervous behavior. It's like, mm -hmm. even when they, they sh black show their teeth, it's a nervous yeah. behavior. People yeah. are like, Oh, it's aggressive. It's, it's nervous. And so, mm -hmm. You know, and, and who knows at what stage that Sasquatch I saw was. Was it a, a full-grown male? I didn't didn't look like a female, but I couldn't be 100% sure. Uh, who knows, you know, what stage of its life or what it was going through. So there's all those scenarios. Who knows? Sure, yeah. I, I You know, it was just it was just a point. Like, you were yeah. there. You would know. Um, I think, you know, your intuition is probably your best tool when it comes to those things. I think, you know, whatever it felt like uh, to you at the time is probably what it was 
Um, I could be wrong. Who knows? No, I, no, man, no. I don't. I don't think. Um, I don't think so. I just, like I said, I just think um, it, it, in so many instances, uh, I think a lot of what drives them is their curiosity to to us. Um, as much as we're curious about them, I I, I think they're just as curious as we uh, uh, about us. Um, Agree. But so um, I, I don't want to keep you too long. I'm going to ask you a couple more questions and I'll get you out of here because I just want to know uh, what your thoughts are on a couple things. Um, what, what do you feel about these tree breaks and twists and stuff? Do you think that the, um, uh, you know, when, when a tree branch is broken and twisted around 360 degrees, um, does your mind go immediately to Sasquatch? No. And, and, and only and the reason I say this is because I don't find a whole lot of that stuff. And we go a lot of different places. Uh, you know, I work with, uh, so, you know, uh, there's so much more to talk about the nest, but, you know, Chris Spencer of the Olympic project, Rebecca and slick and Todd Hiller, uh, right now we've been working together for years, close knit and we get out a lot and we do a lot of traversing. I mean, a lot of traversing and in the areas we work in, we don't find any structures. We don't find, um, Really? I have, I have, oh yeah, I have found some interesting stuff around Mount Hood before, uh, but very far in between when, but there are certain scenarios uh, and I've really not come across a whole bunch. Like the Huckleberry breaks always profound to me because sometimes they're twisted around. Um, and you could tell it's not natural. It's either human or it's not. Um, Cause I always look for the usual things. Okay. Does it have antler marks where, you know, a, a deer's got its, you know, antlers caught up in there and it's twisted around and you know i go through all could have been a bear could have been a, a porcupine porcupines are notorious for doing crazy stuff and all these different animals and then day you can only go okay well, i don't know what that is so um does sasquatch do this stuff quite possibly i mean look at great apes look at animals in general they do some weird stuff and uh, apes are known for throwing rocks people are known for throwing rocks we're known for twisting stuff and breaking stuff um so, I mean, I'm totally open to it. I'm totally open to it. I just, I haven't seen a whole lot of stuff in my research in the field. Uh, so, uh, it's, you know, specifically structures. Anytime I found any sort of structure I thought was kind of weird, it's always been near a, a man-made trail. Mm. Um, and so I can't rule out human. Um, but there has been, and I've been sure, you know, uh, Cliff Berrickman in his museum, where I have a uh, recreation of a nest displayed right now down in Boring, Oregon. Oh, he, yeah. has a, he has a twist. I think he got it from uh, the Squatchatushet guys down in Massachusetts that I thought was phenomenal. Like the, the power it would have taken to twist this thing. It was really interesting. It was more than one twist. It didn't look like nature could have done that, you know, as far as uh, weather related. Uh, I, I, what do you there, do with that? So those Squatchatushet guys, they're just above me. They're only right. one, st one state away. Yeah, I know and them well, yeah. And what this is, these are the things that I see regularly here. Um, I see these twists and these twists, um, uh, uh, the, when it's one thing, right? If it's one branch and it's broken and it's kind of twisted a little bit, I yeah. always say like, yeah, I don't put a whole lot of weight into that because it could be whatever. But when you're finding four, five, six of these things all around the same height, Mm -hmm. eight nine ten feet high all pointing in the same direction spread apart almost the same distance and every single one of them has been it's been re like wrenched around two times three times sometimes just once but it, i'm talking about 360 degrees this thing yeah. is like spiraled around and to the point that the wood is splintering you know what i mean Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and some uh, big, massive branches like this. I don't know what else is out there that could potentially do that. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I never toss that stuff out the window because here's the thing. You know, you could look at, uh, you know, uh, black bear behavior in in Washington, and it would be quite different than a black bear behavior in you know in the South somewhere. Sure. Um, or, or, you know, on the East coast or whatever. So there's no reason, uh, that Sasquatch doesn't have different behavior for different areas but, and do different things because it could have learned something that's totally different from another area. You know, you, almost like a cultural thing within that species up in that area. Absolutely. You know, almost like a culture. So yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, 
Sasquatch does stuff with a purpose. There's no doubt about it, just like all animals do and just like people do. We all have a purpose for what we do. And so something like that, I've seen some twists um, that have been shared with me. Uh, it's mind boggling. And, uh, you know, don't get me wrong. I have seen a few, you know, tree snaps uh, and stuff that I, I, I can't explain. I just can't toss it at Sasquatch. But knowing the areas we work in, you know, it's, it's a process of elimination and you go through that process and then you just, you're kind of left with one of those things that make you go, Hmm, you know? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to skip those questions because I want to do the pictures and then we'll get you out of here, buddy. I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. Um, so let me do this. Let me pull this up. Uh, this part always gets me. Okay. All right. <laughs> Share. And... Uh... Okay, here we go. All right. So. Yeah, I sent you just kind of a, a gamut of photos. I mean, this is just, uh, and it may be hard to see on there, just a impression find where we measured it uh, uh i believe this was in the nest area um but like i said i just sent you a kind of a last minute bunch of photos to share so yeah just uh just an impression found um yeah I put i put the impressions all together okay perfect yeah yeah just, wow that's and, a and a lot of these you know we do cast most of these uh what we've been doing lately via todd helm chris spencer is you know you got these new phones you got these new 3d apps and you can do you know, if you, you don't have casting material on, you can do a 3D scan. And it's almost even better than the casting. Yeah. Uh, you know, the cast afterwards. So what I recommend to people, if they're out there in the woods, you know, if they only, you know, get that 3D, um, you know, app, if you can, if you have a newer iPhone or whatever have you. But if you can, and the best scenario is to cast it, and, but beforehand, do the 3D scan first and then cast it. And then you have two pieces of evidence there. Right? And uh, if the cast doesn't come out good, you have the 3D scan. Yeah, that scanning stuff is really neat, man. Yeah, it's 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 it is really cool. And and sharing these with you, these are not found all the time. They're very rare that we find impressions uh, that we find significant. You know, we do have a lot of known animals in this area, um, but uh, most of these impressions are found off trail. They're not found near trails. They're found off trail in remote areas, and that's why we can rule out hoaxes. And um, you know, we do our due diligence in trying to you know, figure out what made the track. Uh, and then some of them are just dang obvious. You're like, okay, well, sure, that's, yeah. a, that's a big foot. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I think w what's, uh, what's got a 16 inch uh, foot that's walking barefoot in the cold, wet weather in the middle of the woods. I mean, yeah. Uh, well, and speaking of which, so one of the things with these tr track finds we do find periodically, uh, we have found different sizes, but we have been, uh, Pretty, I would say regularly, but you know, a few times a year we do come across 14 inch tracks uh, that are pretty much the same impression, probably the same per individual. And I, I, you know, I find that really fascinating. Mm. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, you ever come across any any uh, uh, baby tracks? Not in this area yet. No, not no. Uh, the soil in this area is like a lot of areas. It's not conducive for tracks. So it has yeah. to be the you know, it could be wet. If you have pine needle, you have uh, just a you know, hard rock and all that. Um, the Lint Project as a whole, David Ellis has found small impressions, but that was up m m by uh, Mount Rainier. Uh, yeah. We call it Littlefoot, and it's it's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, those uh, to me, I don't know why. I said this before. Um, the find seeing the little ones is just so exciting um, because, and, and you you know that obviously there's a a breeding population there has to be but to be able to see the proof uh it's just very exciting i don't know why i get really pumped up about the little baby ones but i'm right there with you i, I dream to find some little i've never found any real small impressions but i dream about it oh yeah they're so neat man and and um i mean obviously you know if you find a 22 inch track well that's pretty exciting too um, true all right so let me get these other ones up here real quick I got a picture actually from a, a friend. I'll send it to you when we're done here. Um, he's from West Virginia and 
he sent me a picture of a baby print not too long ago. Um, it's it's really neat. Cool. It's one of the clearest um, that I've seen. Obviously, you know, I haven't been doing this quite as long as um, some of you guys have, but it's it's pretty clear. What's well, really clear, actually. Um, all right, so here we go. I'm guessing this is the nest. Yeah, it's a reconstructed nest that, that's down in Cliff Berkman's museum uh, down in Boring, Oregon. Um, I built that for a uh, speaking symposium or a, a symposium I was speaking at, and uh, it's down there in display just to show people you can't hike out a, a fresh nest or a nest in general. So I, I built one to showcase how large these things are. Look. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The amount of material. And uh, yeah, so I just wanted to show people in person. Pictures don't do it justice. So I wanted to show people in person what they look like. Look at how thick that is. It's like oh, a mattress, man. Absolutely. And in the center would be a big flat spot where something big had been laying down. Something had been laying, yeah. Yeah, yeah. More oval shaped. Yeah, and that's it, on display at Cliffs Museum. Um, it's So now over time, it's now degraded. It's more brown. <laughs> it's not as green as it once was. Wow, man. Look at that. That's me laying in it, yeah after building it <laughs> and that's about the size of some of these huh yeah yep absolutely that's freaking massive yeah Ma i mean the amount of material you it, it those are individual limbs uh so i mean it's not as if you just grab a pile it's individual limbs it's incredible the the amount of time or and and that the amount of work that went into making one of these things let alone you know 20 some odd of them so uh, I just had this conversation the other day. Uh, holy God, look at the size of that thing. I just had the conversation the other day with somebody um, about uh, uh, the time it must take to build some of these things that, that, that these uh, beings make. Uh, there, there was um, in a documentary that uh, I just watched not too long ago. Oh, God, I'm going to forget the name of it. Um, it was new. Um, not by one of these major like groups that you usually hear about, but um, these younger guys down south somewhere, they had made a documentary a few years back, and then this was the follow-up. Mm -hmm. And what they found, and this was in the middle of the woods, this was not anywhere near water, was this igloo-type structure that was mm -hmm. made out of sticks that were woven together. I mean, the, the, I can't even imagine the time spent to do this because right. it was massive. It, it was like, I forget how tall they said it was, but it was taller than me. Mm -hmm. um, and they said the bottom portion, you could fit um, three full grown humans in there with no problem. Uh, and then there was an upper level. There was an upper level that had its own like so above where th the bottom was there was another layer of sticks woven and and basically like braced hmm. um so something else could lay in there it was a smaller area though so their hypothesis was well maybe that was where the little ones laid if it was um, i got gotcha. so something that sasquatch made but nobody you know who knows but um but hold on, let me get the last pictures and let me get you out of here. Yeah, no problem. That nest, those nests are crazy. I can't even get over it. I can't even get over it. They're so big. Hey, Kyle, while you're pulling those up, I'm going to use a restroom real quick. Go for it, brother. Okay, Go right, for it. Um, a Marriott? You asking me what if it was a Marriott? Who are you talking to? Talking about hotels now? No, the Sasquatch don't stay in a hotel. Good evening, everybody. I'm sorry I haven't been able to say hello to everybody yet tonight. But thank you for being here. How awesome is this? Um... I'm very. I've I've been very excited about this interview. Uh, Shane's such a nice guy, such a nice guy. 
What's up? Hey, Chris Spencer, what's going on? <laughs> I know, I was just being a wise ass. Come on, you know. You know. I see a lot of sorry names. About that. Sorry about being uh, unprofessional myself. <laughs> Yeah, it's all right. I was just dogging you. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> touche, touche. <laughs> That's karma for you. <laughs> uh, oh, actually, I was saying the complete opposite. Um, so, all right, these the, the last pictures. Let's get them up here. Um, I don't know why they don't make this a quicker thing, or unless it's just me and I. I'm not very good at this stuff yet. Um, Okay, here we go. And this is a, this is like five or six pictures, I believe. So this one, I'll pull this one up first. Okay, the reason uh, which we didn't talk about, but one of the things we've been doing in the nest area, being run by Chris Spencer of the Olympic Project, and with the help of Squatcher Metrics, is doing a a two year long um, audio analysis or audio recording project. Chris Spencer has uh, purchased a couple of SM4s, which are long duration. Uh, long-term audio recording devices and uh, they're very expensive, but it rec they record every single night of the year. So we've been documenting what? every, Oh yeah. Yeah. Get Chris Spencer on here sometime. He'll, he'll blow your mind because I believe he's in my chat right now. He might be. He's uh he's, uh, I can't say enough about Chris Spencer and the work. I mean, <laughs> he's probably literally listening and watching the show and reviewing audio because he, this is a, a spectrograph spectrogram and so we you know we uh, you know that look at or listen to audio don't just listen to it we look at it we look for signatures and then we compare them to known animals and that's why uh chris spencer is about one of the best out there when it comes to doing this stuff because he spends i mean when you record every night for over a year that has a tremendous amount of audio to go through and he visually looks at it through a spectrograph and um and, and, and finds, you know, gold nuggets when they're available. And uh, so I just included this because I wanted to remember to touch upon this and give Chris a lot of credit because, um, you know, we have a, a light analysis report on the uh, Olympic Project website, olympicproject.com. People can go and look at where documented all the known species that have been recorded. And then we showcase some of the unknowns that have been going on in this area. And They've been compared, you know, to, uh, you know, the unknowns have been vetted and compared to other known animals and, and whatnot. So it is one of the coolest things we've been working on the last couple of years, uh, specifically Chris Spencer. He's he's an he's an absolute beast uh, at this stuff. And uh, he's found some amazing things. <laughs> well, Chris, if if th that was you who made the comment and you're still here, um, I would love to have you on the show to talk about this. It'd be amazing. Um I'll tell you right now, I've only listened to a handful of uh, audio, and I don't know if I could imagine having to listen to that much of it. It's, that's a lot, man. That's yeah. a lot. One of the, like I said, with the, uh, by visually looking at stuff, Chris is, he's been doing it a while now. He's very good at it. So, you know, listening to audio could be tedious if you don't know where to, you know, say you heard something in person, you go back, oh, okay, was that such and such a time? But if you were to record every night and have to listen from, you know, beginning to the end, it would take you forever. So by visually looking at stuff. Oh, OK. Yeah, it, it, it's a lot quicker. But um, that's the importance of staying. You know, we're not ambulance chasers. We work in specific areas for eons, years and years and years, because yeah. we want to get familiar, not just with the unknown stuff. We want to get familiar with all the natural sounds in these areas so that we can rule those out. And when something anomalous comes up on a spectrograph, for example, it sticks out like a sore thumb, you yeah. know, and then you start getting patterns where you're seeing the same signatures, same resonation, same harmonics and all that. And then it sticks out and you're like, okay, we got something here. And, uh, you know, uh, Chris is very good at explaining it. So. Well, I get, I'd love to talk to him. That's amazing. That stuff really is, um, it's, it's so, uh, it's amazing to me. Next generation um, I, research to me. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I could look at this and uh, I, I see that there's a slight change there, but I would have no idea um, what any of that means. So kudos to, to Mr. Spencer um, for being able to look at these things and know what's going on. Um, all right. Next one. And there's speaking of Spencer, <laughs> there he is. There there. is. 
Now, that's not one of his SM4s. That's one of his older units. We still utilize those, uh, but it's a, a long-term uh, recorder uh, placed in like kind of a, a case there. We place out there. We hide them usually in stumps. And uh, like th those particular recorders will last for a couple of weeks, you know, so we can record for a couple of weeks, three weeks roughly. Um, and they're phenomenal. Uh, Chris is just up the game and up his ante where he can now record for months on end. That's amazing. Just look at that, uh, you guys who are watching. Just just look at all the plants around this man. Look at how thick and dense that stuff is. It could be any. Look at this. Yeah, Ooh. that's. I, I shared that picture to kind of showcase one of the areas. You know, I mean, if you were a, you know, I I, I wanted to showcase the person there. I think that's Chris Spencer there. But you, if you a couple feet more, and you would never see him. Never. That's all the evergreen huckleberry I'm talking about. That's what the nests are made out of, that huckle, huckleberry. It's everywhere. Everywhere. Salau and huckleberry are the two most prominent plants out there beside the Douglas fir. And um, those uh, particular Douglas fir, well, Salau and huckleberry, and then you get the Douglas fir trees and other pines, but um, you know, it hasn't been harvested in over 50 years, which is another key aspect to this area. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, just an example of a break where it's been, you know, and, uh, you know, your average person looking at there, ah, oh, it's just a, a break. But when you start coming across a lot of these, and this is what in the nest area would look like, you would see a lot of breaks like this, twisted and peeled, snapped off. Sometimes, you know, just completely snapped or just peeled. And that's what the uh, nests were made out of, that huckleberry. And, and some of that's very, I mean, I'm a pretty strong guy. Derek Randall's is a very strong guy, and you, we can't break some of this stuff. So it takes something a lot of strength and an opposable thumb, in my opinion. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, 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 it's purposeful, like you said. So, I mean, it's good to me. It, it's got to have a thumb. Um, a bear, I guess, could walk up to that and with its mouth, bite it and snap it. I guess. Yeah. And they, but, they can actually use their, their paws to do some stuff like that. But they almost always leave some sort of uh, telltale sign that they've done it. And to do to tip to break something, you know, eight, nine feet off the ground without leaving anything else broken around it right you need something tall just to snap i mean it's it's you know it's one of those scenarios where you just kind of have to be there to see it but uh maybe someone else will come across something like that and it'll register in their brain and be like whoa i should look further into this right right i think this is the last one yeah just more huckleberry breaks um yeah that are peeled uh these were found not too long ago um but uh pretty uh i mean and when you got an area where it's just nothing but that i mean this is a few you walk into some of these areas where these nests are at and it's every single bush every single one and the leaves are stripped from them so you have these you know you know here you see all the leaves in some cases all those leaves are stripped in the nest area where they've been plucked off not with teeth something with fingers and then piled or thrown into the nest as a kind of a cushion um so yeah it's pretty pretty uh pretty interesting stuff man it, it just, man, I don't know. It's just so cool. It's just so cool. Um, that that little kid in me just still gets excited for it now like I would when I was uh, nine years old and looking at those books in the library. Um, it really is just the coolest subject. I don't care what anybody says. Um, and I think you guys are doing amazing work out there. Um, the, the level of dedication and... Um, uh, the, the detail, uh, like you said, you guys are focused on one area and doing, um, you know, you know, how you have Chris is focused on, uh, that aspect of things. And then, mm. um, it, it's really just amazing. Uh, I, I forget who said it to me, um, but it wasn't too long ago. And they said, you know, if you find an area that seems like there's stuff going on there, don't go anywhere else. Right. Stay there, hunker down, and continue researching that area. Um, just because a few months go by and things are slow, it'll come back. Because if it, if they they were there once, they'll probably be there again. Um, and there's stuff to learn there. And um, I mean, you guys obviously have probably one of the best areas in the country uh, when it comes to that stuff. Um, I, I think so. And to your point, I, Weber told you that I think it's a genius because I think that's very smart words. You know, 
you, you learn just as oh, much. I, I said it to myself. Oh, okay, good. Well, all right, then you're a genius. You're welcome. <laughs> but, you know, you learn just as much when nothing's going on as sure. when there is stuff going on. Because, I mean, in, in these net, the nest area and, and other few other areas we, we research in, there's mu- there's times when there nothing's going on. It's not like it's all the time. Right. If it was, this game would have been done a long time ago for right. anybody that wants to prove it. So learning the area that you're working in over a length period of time, knowing all the animals, all the weather conditions, all the terrain, uh, the seasons, is just as important uh, as, you know, having an actual encounter or, or recording something. I mean, we all live for that stuff, right? But the better you know the area, the more patterns you're going to pick up. You know, yeah. catalog that stuff. Take down all the data you can, you know, when stuff's going on and when stuff's not going on. You know, w- what other animals are in there? What are they doing? How are they reacting? When are they there? When are they not there? I mean, and mm-hmm. then you start to really paint a picture and you get to know the area and you become the expert of that area and no one else can take that away from you. Right. Yep. There is, there's as much to, to be learned from the times when it's slow for, you know, these creatures um, as, uh, as it is when it's active. Um, and uh, greetings, greetings, uh, off world. Thank you for coming. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's all so cool, man. Um, listen, the, I, this is great, dude. I, um, like I said, I, I admire the work you guys are doing. Um, you have been nothing but uh, humble and kind, and I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. Um, I'd love to have you back on at some point. This felt like it was 15 minutes for me, but um, I'm having a good time, so... <laughs> Just invite uh, me back. I'll be back. I've, I've enjoyed uh, I've enjoyed the conversation being here, and, and and thanks again, Kyle, for having me on. You know, anytime I get to talk about this passion and this this hobby or whatever you want to call, it, I, you know, take my money. <laughs> well, if you're offering, <laughs> <laughs> all right, take my time. But uh, yeah, all right, you know, all right, it's good. it's uh, yeah, it goes both ways. I appreciate being here. Well, thank you very much. We'll definitely have you back on. We'll stay in contact. Uh, I'll send you a couple pictures when we're done here. Um, and Chris, uh, you know, if, if you're willing, uh, I'd love to have you on too, man. Um, like Shane said, anytime I get to talk about this stuff, it's a good day for me. So, uh, uh, <laughs> let me know. I'll reach out see if I can get your, uh, Facebook or however I can get in contact with you. Um, guys, thank you so much for being here. Listen, I, I'm, I, I told Shane before the show, I'm usually not this laid back and, you know, lounging. Um, somebody said they didn't see Ollie tonight. No, you didn't see Ollie. Uh, Shane, Ollie's my, one of my cats. Okay. Um, he always, always, it is no fail. 100% of the time when I do a show, he ends up in my lap. 100% of the time. I won't see him all day. The second I go live, he gets in my lap and gets in front of the uh, camera. Um, so people were worried about Ollie. Ollie's fine. I'm house sitting and, and dog sitting for my brother. So uh, tonight it's Huck and Huck is laying on the floor because he is way too big to get in my lap. Um, <laughs> he's not a cat. He's like a hundred pound uh, uh, golden doodle. So not happening. Um, but so, yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, I'm sorry I was gone for about a week or so, but I just had to, I just had to, you know, relax and rest a little bit. So. Um, but I'm back. I will be back in a couple of days. I will let you guys know. I'll post some stuff and let you know what's coming up next. I had to reschedule some people from the time I took off. But um, you'll know as soon as I uh, have it all ironed out. And um, until then, uh, I love you all. Take care of yourselves. If you're not connected, get connected. Good night, guys. <laughs>